everybody, thank you for, for being here. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. So we're going to kick off our afternoon session with He O from Yale University. So they are telling us about rigidity and problem groups. So thank you. So it's a great uh, honor and pleasure to give this lecture in the conference for Danny Sullivan. So basically, I feel like for the last 15 years, I've been working on Sullivan theory on Klein young groups. <laughs> but I'm especially uh, happy to give this lecture because I met Dennis for the first time uh, during most of the 90s birthday conference at Yale, and it was 2013. And uh, the talk I'm giving is really inspired by most of the Sullivan research theorem. Very happy to give this talk, and then when Ara actually asked me to give a talk here, I felt like, oh, I have a perfectly correct theorem actually to present at this conference, so, which we just proved. Is there a question? Not so high. This is not turned on. Yeah. Look, we know from the computer. The mouse. There you go. Uh, okay, so oh my God. So I briefly explain the title of my talk. So by Klein Young group, so I simply mean it's a discrete subgroup of PSL 2 c uh, But you, as you see, actually most of the time I be just assuming my Klein Young group is a portion-free discrete subgroup. And um, by originality, uh, what I mean is this. So we consider some discrete faithful representation of gamma into PSL2C. Okay? And then we like to ask, when is this representation trivial? And what does uh, that mean? Yep. What does that mean? So I explain. It's discrete and faithful. It's not tri trivial. So I'm asking, when is it all trivial? Okay, so no, I didn't even define what is a trivial representation, but that was going to be my next sentence. So trivial representation, I mean the representation which exists for obvious reasons, but I'll give you a precise definition of trivial representation in a few slides. Okay? But this is just a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. Okay? So, but this question about the rigidity of Klein Young groups is related to the rigidity of hyperbolic stream manifolds and uh, understanding this relation uh, will be important uh, for my, uh, the rest of the talk. So I'll explain actually a little bit about hyperbolic stream manifolds. So hyperbolic three space is the yeah the unique simply connected three-dimensional Riemannian manifold with constant sectional coverage negative one. But I use very simple model, the top space model. So you just have to know. Uh, so H three uh, is simply realized as this x one x two positive y. So it's just uh, uh, above the x one x two plane. And hyperbolic metric is the Euclidean metric over the uh, last coordinate. Uh, yeah, so I have this x1, x2 plane, which also I think of it as a complex plane, and that is above it. And the uh, geometric boundary of H3 is, as I just said, is the complex plane uh, with a point at infinity. So it's the extended complex plane, or we can also think of it as a Riemann sphere. The geodesics look like this. It's either uh, the vertical line, or there's a circle meeting the boundary orthogonally. So this is the basic information. Oh, so I guess this, uh, the black box will be here all the time? Is, this the, is it possible to remove this black box? Or? Well, there is someone that wants that. But it's so inaccurate as to be useless. <laughs> right, I mean, I think nobody in this room has to read and it's going to, I guess, oh, uh, hide some of my lines. But yeah, I have to just switch on these. Oh, you have to read. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Okay, let's see how it goes. Yeah, so. I don't know. Can it be you can't move. Leave it. Leave it. Okay, so this is so what's the isometric group of H3? So uh, the well-known Poincaré extension theorem identifies isometric group of H3 with a group of Magnus transformations of C hat. So C hat is my notation for the extended complex plane. And Magnus transformation, by definition, this is a composition of finitely many inversions with respect to circles. And uh, this is the this picture defines what an inversion with respect to circle means. It's a, you consider a circle on radius r uh, with the center a, and inversion with respect to circle maps p to p prime in this picture. And to find the p prime, we look at the line connects p and the center. 
Okay? And P' prime is defined by this condition. The distance from P' prime to the center times the distance from P to A should be exactly radius squared. Okay? So the inversion maps P to P' prime uh, by this formula. Now, to understand the Poincaré extension theorem, I have to explain to you how do we think of inversion with respect to circle in the plane as an uh, isometry of H3. Okay? So again, the second picture explains the, uh, the extension. So for a given circle, so we are we will be looking at this northern hemisphere just above the circle, and now think of inversion with respect to this sphere. Okay? Then clearly the it preserves the pop space. The point P above the pop above the complex plane goes to a point still above the uh, the complex plane, the x1 x2 plane. So clearly it preserves the pop space, and then can also check that uh, it preserves hyperbolic metric. So we get an isometry of H3. Okay? So moreover, so Poincaré extension theorem says that every isometry of H3 arises in this way. So that gives us identification. The group of Mavis transformation is precisely isometry of H3. Now the group PSL2C acts on uh, C hat by this linear fractional transformation. A, B, C, D maps Z to A, Z plus D over C, Z plus D. And using this action, every element of PSL2C can be written as the composition of even number of inversions with respect to circles. Okay? So this gives that uh, the PSL2C is exactly the index to normal subgroup of the Mavis transformation, and it is exactly also the group of orientation preserving isometries of H3. So we have this identification. PSL2C is the orientation preserving isometries of H3, and then the Mavis transformations are exactly the isometries of H3. So I already defined what is the Kleinian group, but now uh, the Kleinian group is discrete subgroup of PSL2C, but we identified PSL2C as the group of orientation preserving isometries of H3. So which means that when I have a Kleinian group, it will act on H3, uh, because it's a discrete group, it will act properly discontinuously, and it will act as a, a orientation preserving isometries. Okay? So we can form a quotient of H3 by a Kleinian group, and we get a hyperbolic three manifold. Okay. And moreover, any complete oriented hyperbolic 3 manifold can always be obtained in, the, in that way. So it is always quotient of H3 by a Kleinian group, and this Kleinian group is precisely the fundamental group of M. Okay. So, uh, yeah, by the way, so I'm assuming my Kleinian groups are all torsion free, otherwise I'll have to talk about orbit fold, but uh, I'm just assuming all Kleinian groups are torsion free. Okay. So this is a relation between Kleinian group and hyperbolic manifolds, and clearly the rigidity of uh, Kleinian groups are related to the rigidity of hyperbolic three manifolds, because all hyperbolic three manifolds are obtained in this way. So we will be interested in the following class of Kleinian groups. So the first one will be uh, lattices, and the Kleinian group is called the lattice if the corresponding hyperbolic manifold has finite volume. So it could be compact, but there are also finite volume hyperbolic manifolds which are non compact. It's not very easy to construct actually finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds, uh, and most construction actually uses some number theoretic method, but, uh, the, but there exist infinitely many. So the next class actually we want to look at uh, so called geometrically finite groups, and the Kleinian group is called geometrically finite uh, if gamma has finite sided the fundamental domain, okay? and that is is our whole geometrically finite. Okay, and then uh, and all geometry finite groups are finite degenerated. So we will be considering this three class of Kleinian groups. And we we'll always assume that my Kleinian group is always finite degenerated. I'll be only considering finite generated Kleinian groups. And I also assume uh, gamma is non elementary. And this means that gamma does not have abelian subgroup of finite index. It's called the non virtually abelian. And then the third condition is that uh, gamma is non fuchsia this means that gamma is not contained uh, in PSL to R up to any conjugation. Okay? So uh, this will be a standing assumption about my client angle. And uh, so here is a classification of elements of PSL to C. So of the conjugation, every non-trivial element G of PSL to C is one of the following. So the first one is that uh, it is a rotation about zero. So G maps Z to E to the I theta times Z. So in this case, of course, the eigenvalues have all modulus 1. And uh, the element G is called elliptic in this case. 
And the, the second case is that g is expansion about zero. So uh, g maps z to lambda z, where the lambda is a complex number with uh, modulus strictly bigger than one. So in this case, g is called the loxodromy. And if g is not one of these two, then g always has to be a translation by one. Again, of the conjugation. And in this case, g is called the parabolic. So any non-trivial element of g is one of the three, elliptic, loxodromic, or parabolic. And we say representation of gamma into PSL to see type preserving. If this representation preserves types of elements of gamma, it maps loxodromic, loxodromic, and it maps parabolic, parabolic. I don't have to talk about elliptic because I assume the gamma is torsion free, then gamma cannot contain any elliptic elements. So in this talk, all of my representations will again be assumed uh, type preserving. But type preserving is something very natural, but, so I'm not going to repeat, but it will always be assumed uh, it is type preserving. Okay, so, so let gamma be a Kleinian group, so I assume that this Kleinian group is uh, non-elementary, finite generated, also non fuchsia And consider discrete. So discrete means that the image is again a discrete group. And faithful means that uh, it is projective. Okay? Uh, question. What does it mean to be type preserving if gamma is an abstract group? Uh, gamma is a Kleinian group. Gamma, my gamma is a subgroup of PSL 2C. Oh, it is a subgroup already. Yeah. So oh. gamma is always a Kleinian group. I fixed my gamma. We are Kleinian group satisfying these three conditions. In, throughout my talk, my gamma is a discrete subgroup of PSL 2C. I don't consider any other. And you consider another discrete faithful representation? No, I consider discrete faithful representation of gamma into PSL2C, so gamma will be isomorphic to the image, right? Because the representation is discrete and faithful, yes. <coughs> so you can think also like that. I have two discrete represent two Kleinian groups inside PSL2C, and my row is isomorphism between them, yes? Okay, so so I, and I denote by R disk gamma the collection of all such representations. So, so gamma is a fixed Kleinian group, and R disk gamma is collection of all discrete faithful preserving representations. And it is called the discrete locus of representation variety. Okay? So the name makes sense because okay, I'm looking at the representations, and then I'm only looking at the discrete representations. So now I'm defining what I mean by trivial representation. So my gamma is a subgroup PSL2C. So take any element Mebius transformation. Okay? And PSL2C is a normal <coughs> subgroup of the group of Mebius transformations. So if I think about the conjugation of, say, gamma goes to G gamma G inverse, so the image lies inside PSL2C. And it is clearly discrete and faithful. Okay? So these are the representations which I want to call trivial representations. And the trivial representations correspond exactly the corresponding hyperbolic three manifolds. So H3 mode gamma and H3 mode rho gamma, they are isometric. Because the Mebius transformations are exactly the isometry of H3s. Uh, when you exclude the, the, uh, the, the Fuchsian case, are you yes, saying I'm after isomorphism? Yeah. So in particular, are you also excluding quasi Fuchsian groups? No, I'm not excluding quasi Fuchsian groups. I'm only excluding Fuchsian case. Okay. Yeah. The quasi Fuchsians are in fact actually. Uh, somehow more important examples for my talk. I see. So the result question, uh, I wanted to ask you to find some weak hypothesis on the representation which would imply the triviality of rho. And uh, as you know, actually, so this is a celebrated theorem of Mosto. So Mosto was actually director of graduate studies uh, when I was a graduate student in Yale, actually like five, thirty years ago. So, uh, most of the theorem says that if gamma is a lattice, which means that exactly the corresponding hyperbolic manifold is a finite volume, then any representation, any discrete phase representation is triggered. Okay? So it is only the conjugation by a Mebius transformation, which means that the whole discrete locus just consists of trivial representations. So in fact, actually, most of proved the theorem for co-compact lattices, and then the general lattice case was actually completed by Prasad by extending Mostow's approach. So it is sometimes called the Mostow Prasad theorem. And the same theorem is true, in fact, actually, for any dimension or uh, any three, but uh, the analogous uh, statement is not true for dimension two. Because of this, so if gamma is a lattice in PSL2R, so 
just like PSL2C was identified with a group of orientation preserving isometries of H3, so PSL2R is also uh, the orientation preserving isometries of hyperbolic plane. So if this is a lattice, then the quotient of H2 by gamma, this is a finite area Riemann surface of genus always at least two, and possibly with the punctures. It might have punctures or it might not have punctures. So here's the picture, it has three punctures here, and genus two. Okay. In this case, the, the discrete locus uh, of the representation variety of gamma modular the conjugations, it, this is exactly what is called the tight space of uh, the surface S, and it has this dimension, 6G minus 6 plus 2P. Okay. And then since G is at least two, this is always positive number. So the discrete locus is very, very far from being trivial. So the most of the theorem does not work for dimension two. Okay, so uh, this is actually a well-known consequence of most of reductive theorem. So it says that the finite volume hyperbolic three manifold is completely determined by its topology. So if you have a two finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds, and if they are homeomorphic, it, which means that uh, their fundamental groups are isomorphic, for instance, then uh, M1 and M2 have to be isometric to each other. And another consequence is that uh, there are only countably many lattices uh, up to conjugation, and or there are only countably many finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds up to isometry. So this consequence also uh, can be deduced from local study, but it is also a consequence from most of it. Okay, so we know about this question about residual lattices. So the next question is, uh, what about for general Kleinian group, which are not necessarily lattices? So in studying general Kleinian group, so the limit set is actually a very important uh, object, and it is defined in the following way. So my gamma is always fixed Kleinian group, and limit set of gamma is defined as accumulation points of the orbit of gamma. But however, actually, I think actually this picture, uh, this is snow cooling picture, but the snow is actually just this blue dust here. So this picture explains what limit set is. So you start uh, with any fixed point uh, O in hyperbolic three space, uh, and then you have this uh, snow falling, and then where the snow lands, this is exactly the limit set. Okay? You collect uh, all the points where snow lands, and this is exactly your limit set. Okay? And uh, ordinary set is by definition simply the complement of the limit set. So limit set is uh, some complex subset in your Riemann sphere, and then the ordinary set, therefore, is the open subset, which is the complement of the limit set. If gamma is a lattice, so gamma is a lattice means that the corresponding the quotient hyperbolic manifold is a finite volume, which means gamma is really, really big because you, 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 you quotient H3 and then you suddenly get finite volume. So actually gamma, the snow actually goes all over the places and then it lands all over the places. So in that case, the limit set is everything. But otherwise, uh, uh, in general, actually, limit set gives you actually this uh, very beautiful image of fractal sets. Uh, so these are a few examples of images of limit set. Uh, so in this picture, the black part is the limit set, and the white part is the ordinary set. And the, the first picture, this is exactly the quiz function example you asked them. So it may not be obvious, but uh, the limit set in this case is homeomorphic to a circle. Okay? So this is a very complicated circle in the first example. And uh, in this example, and then in this example, these two examples, uh, in these two examples, the limit says so homeomorphic to a CRPC gasket, the okay? CRPC carpet. And this last example, this is something called the shocky dust. So in this case, the limit set is totally disconnected. Okay? So I wanted to, uh, you to have some idea about how limit sets in general looks like. So I'm showing you this picture. Okay, so Arcus major conjecture uh, divides the limit set of finite generated Kleinian group into two kinds. It says that for any finitely generated Kleinian group, the Kleinian group of this free sub PSL 2C, either limit set is everything or it has a Lebesgue measure zero. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So limit set is a complex subset of extended complex plane, so the Lebesgue measure makes sense. So I have a Lebesgue measure of the plane and then the Lebesgue measure is equal to zero. And this theorem actually was proved uh, by Dick Canary, but assuming Tamnitz conjecture, and the Tamnitz conjecture is now resolved by Abel and Calagari Gabay, uh, so now this is a theorem. But Arthur himself actually proved this theorem already when um, gamma is geometrically finite. 
But gamma is geometry finite, and in this case, actually, the first case happens only for lattices. So for geometry finite, so this theorem would say that either gamma is a lattice, uh, and hence the limit set is everything, or the Lebesgue measure is equal to zero. So for geometry finite group, non-lattices have a Lebesgue measure, zero limit set. But of course, this theorem is interesting because there are finitely generated geometry for infinite groups with limit set everything. Okay, so there are examples of non-lattices, but they will have to be geometry infinite, and then they have a limit set everything. And in fact, now it's, uh, it can be deduced by Abel theorem that every lattice actually contains a, such a subgroup, such a geometry infinite subgroup with uh, limit set everything. Okay, so for Kleinian groups, suppose limit set is everything, so I just said that they are either lattices or some geometrically infinite groups. In that case, then it's already proved what is called the quasi conformal residuity uh, of such a Kleinian group, and let me explain the terminology. So, uh, homeomorphism, say F2 of two domains from D to D prime, this is called the quasi conformal, K quasi conformal, if F maps every infinitesimal circle to ellipses of eccentricity bounded by k. Okay? That's what k quasi conformal means. So, and it is also explained in this picture. So f has to map very small circle uh, to, to something, but uh, which is contained in an annulus whose modulus is bounded by k. Okay? Then, uh, then f is called k quasi conformal. So it may not be obvious, but one crazy, one crazy conformal, which means that if f maps all infinitesimal circles to infinitesimal circles, then in fact f has to be conformal, meaning that f is holomorphic with non-zero derivative. Okay? So for instance, one crazy conformal map on the Riemann sphere, this is safe to say that the map is Mebus transformation, because uh, yeah, Mebus transformation is exactly the conformal automorphism so we should have, and it is also safe to say that F maps not only infinitesimal circle, but F maps every circle, the honest circle to a circle. Okay? So these three conditions are in people. So you're assuming that F preserves orientation also? Yes. Yeah. Now, a representation uh, of gamma into PSL2C is called the quasi conformal deformation of gamma if there exists a row equivariant quasi conformal homeomorphism of the Riemann sphere. And row equivariant, in other words, this is exactly the same to say that. So there is a some quasi conformal homeomorphism of the Riemann sphere, and when I conjugate the element uh, of Kleinian group using that quasi conformal homeomorphism, so I look at F composed by gamma composed by F inverse. So these are all maps on C hat, right? Because my Kleinian group is an element of PSL2C, and uh, I can understand it as a map on the Riemann sphere. So I, I compose uh, uh, F and gamma in F inverse, so conjugation of gamma in F, if that is equal to the image of gamma on the row. Rho gamma is equal to F composed by gamma composed by F inverse, then rho is called the quasi conformal deformation, and F is called the associated quasi uh, conformal homeomorphism. Okay? So this is the definition of rho quasi uh, conformal deformation. Okay. And clearly, the trivial representations are quasi conformal deformations because if I have a trivial representation, uh, my F is going to be the Mebus transformation. And then uh, it just means that uh, I, my rho is the conjugation by a Mebus transformation. Okay? So trivial representations are quasi conformal deformations. But uh, in general, it's not obvious at all why it should exist, right? Like uh, you have this definition of. Uh, Quasi conformal deformation, and then suddenly when you conjugate, it suddenly becomes a Mebius transformation. It has to become Mebius transformation to be okay, quasi conformal deformation. So, in any case, so collection of all quasi conformal deformations is called the Tecumna space of gamma, and this is clearly a subset of the discrete locus of the representation variety because uh, this is always discrete and then uh, type preserving and phase okay? So, this is a subset. And this type of space again contains trivial representations. In fact, actually, this quasi conformal deformation sector played a very important role in most of the original proof. So, most of the proof for uh, co compact lattice consists of two steps. In the first step, he showed that every discrete faithful representation of a co compact lattice is, in fact, 
strategic conformal deformation of gamma. So, so because I, we start with a compact, uh, co-compact lattice, you have this tessellation of H3 by a translation of compact fundamental domain. And then using Rho, actually, he says that this map induces a map from H3 to H3, which almost is an isometric, called the quasi isometry. And then he showed that you can extend this to the boundary, the Riemann sphere, and then, in fact, the map is quasi conformal homeomorphism over there. So this was a very important first step in this proof. So he, this was the first step. The, the second step, he showed that every quasi conformal deformation of a co compact lattice is indeed a conjugation by Davis transformation. And this second step uses the ergodicity of the geodesic flow of the associated hyperbolic three manifold. So now, uh, so then it's sorry, but quasi conformal rigidity theorem says that the second step of the most of proof, which says that the quasi uh, conformal deformation of a lattice is all trivial. That actually, that is still true for non lattices uh, as long as the uh, limit set is everything. So this is a, that is a theorem. So gamma is a finitely generated Kleinian group with the limit set everything. Okay. Then, sorry. <coughs> then any element of the type space, uh, meaning that any quasi conformal deformation uh, of gamma uh, is simply conjugation by Bevis transformation. So whole type space is trivial in that case. So in fact, Sully one proved this theorem uh, in a slightly, seemingly more slightly general setup, which is that what he shows th is that if the associated uh, quasi conformal homeomorphism, because I'm starting with the quasi conformal deformation, so there is associated the quasi conformal homeomorphism of the Riemann sphere, and if then maybe it's conformal on the ordinary set, then it has to be maybe transformation, and then the representation has to be trivial. That's what he proved. Uh, but however, the Arthur's measure conjecture, and together with the uh, measure of Riemann mapping theorem says that this statement actually has meaning only when uh, omega is empty. So unless omega is empty, the Arthur's measure conjecture says that omega is a full Lebesgue measure, right? Because omega is the complement of the uh, limit set. So therefore, actually, uh, somehow Sullivan theorem actually boils down to this statement. So when lambda is everything, then you know that uh, you understand the time space of gamma. It has to be true. So, okay, so now we are interested in the case the limit that is not everything, okay? So we talked about when the limit set is everything. So if the limit set is not everything, or equivalently, if the ordinary set is non-empty, in this case, type plus space uh, is huge, so you cannot expect the Sullivan theorem, because first, by Arcos finite with theorem, so the quotient of omega by gamma, so this is the Riemann surface of finite type. Uh, so if, you, if I denote S1 to SK the connected components, then the type of the space of this Kleinian group, so up to some equivalence, it is basically equal to the product of the type of the space of each surface SI, but we just saw that actually the type of the space of each surface here is huge. So the type of the space uh, is huge unless you are actually uh, limited to everything. Okay? So now this is the motivation for our question. So then uh, we cannot expect, expect that the type of the space is trivial, so therefore now we change our question. So what conditions on the representation would guarantee the representation is trivial? So a uh, representation is trivial. It's equivalent to say that the associated quasi conformal homeomorphism is a Mabius transformation. And it is same to say that it maps all circles to circles. Okay. So, so Sullivan's theorem can be formulated in this way. So if the quasi conformal homeomorphism is conformal on the ordinary set, then it has to be Mabius transformation. Okay? So then we ask, okay, what if, if I change it conformal on the ordinary set to conformal on the limit set? Okay? So I'd like to ask, so suppose my uh, quasi conformal homeomorphism is conformal on the limit set. Uh, then is it true F has to be a Mabius transformation? But of course, uh, the limit set is the Lebesgue measure zero, so I have to explain what do I mean by conformal on the Lebesgue measure zero set. And then I'd like to convince you this is the natural uh, meaning that, uh, that we can call F is conformal on limit set. So I'd like to propose that, okay, F is conformal on the limit set to be understood as that F maps all the circles in lambda to circles. So surface in lambda simply means the circle intersection lambda, or you can think of it as a circular slice of lambda. Okay? 
So if f maps every circular slice of lambda to circle, then can we say uh, f has to be Mabel's transformation? So I hope, uh, is this clear? Any question about this setup? So in fact, this is what we prove. So this is joint work uh, uh, with Dong Yul Kim, who is here. So, so this is mainly, it is actually still true if lambda is everything, but then of course the interest is when lambda is not everything. So, and then we know that the Lebesgue measure of lambda is equal to zero. And suppose the row is any quasi conformal deformation of a Kleinian group. And uh, I am denoting capital F for the associated quasi conformal homeomorphism. And I'm assuming the ordinary set has at least two components, two connected components. So of course, if ordinary set has two connected components, uh, at least two connected components, this is same to say ordinary set is not connected, right? It means it's not connected, but somehow saying not connected sounds so negative, so I wanted to <laughs> formulate out them in a positive way. So I'm saying that it has at least two connected components. And these are the some examples that I showed you. So this example, remember? So in this example, the limit set is only working to circle. So ordinary set has two components. So, so these crazy Fuchsian groups are very good uh, example for our theorem. And then, of course, in this example, it is only working to CRP gasket. So it has infinitely many connected components. But however, if you remember the Schwarke dust picture, in the Schwarke dust, the, the limit set is totally disconnected. So the complement is connected. So this theorem does not apply to uh, Schwarke groups. Okay? So this is a place where it's really important that you exclude the Fuchsian case, because it can, this condition be trivial. Exactly, exactly, right. right. So then the, our theorem says that if f is conformal on the limit set, meaning that f maps every circular slice of lambda to circles, then f has to be Mabel's transformation, and my representation is triggered. My representation will be uh, conjugation by Mabel's transformation, and has triggered. So here is the picture. Uh, so okay, so I'm somehow thinking this okay, the Fuchsian example. And then uh, note first actually, if the circle intersects on lambda uh, has at most three points, then this condition is empty because every three points in the plane is contained in the in some circle. Okay? So this condition has meaning only the circular slice of lambda has at least four points. Okay? So this is the picture. I have four points here lying in some circle. Okay? And then I want, I don't want this circle to be mapped to circle, but I want these four points to be mapped to four points which lies in some circle. That's, the, that's what the theorem is. So in fact, actually, uh, we prove this theorem in a more general setup. So a row can be, it does not have to be a uh, quasi conformal deformation, but it can be any uh, discrete space representation. But I, we need to assume the existence of boundary map, so-called boundary map, and this is the definition of boundary map. So for a given uh, discrete space representation, a row boundary map uh, is simply a row equivariant continuous embedding of the limit set. So we don't even ask actually this boundary map to be defined the whole Riemann sphere. It just has to be a continuous embedding of the limit set, okay, to see that. Uh, so idea is something like this. So we would like to have some map uh, at infinity, or the a sphere at infinity, or the, in, the, in the limit set, which kind of, which is related to our original representation. So if I have a if I have a point to say Cushy in the limit set, so by definition of the limit set, there has to be some sequence which accumulating to Cushy because the limit set was the or the collection of accumulation points of the orbit, right? Then what we would like is that we would like the F to this boundary map to map Cushy to F Cushy, where F Cushy will now be the limit point of the corresponding sequence. So if I had here had a gamma i going to Cushy, then I would like to have rho gamma i converging to F Cushy. Okay, so this is the idea about the boundary map. And as you can somehow imagine, if it exists, there can be at most one. It has to be somehow the canonical one in some sense. And the boundary map exists actually in many cases. For instance, we just saw that in the case of quasi conformal deformations, already quasi conformal homeomorphism, you just have to restrict the quasi conformal homeomorphism to the limit set, and that gives us equivalent continuous embedding. So all the quasi conformal deformations admit boundary map. And another important case is that uh, if my gamma and rho gamma, if we both start geometrically finite, then it is a 2 key theorem that the rho boundary map always exists. Okay. So, OK, 
Okay, so now uh, we still to slightly more general theorem. So now instead of uh, just quiz, quiz conformal deformation, that will be any discrete space representation of my Kleinian group, but I will assume there exists a boundary method, okay, which is a divariant continuous embedding of the limit set. In this case, actually, the same theorem works, but in fact, we prove even stronger theorem. So the stronger theorem is this. So again, as before, we assume that uh, the ordinary set is disconnected, so it has at least two connected components. But now, this time, instead of asking all the circular slices of lambda uh, to be mapped to circles, it suffice to ask some open collection of circular slices to be mapped to circles. Okay? So if there is a, some open collection of circles, of course, intersecting the limit set, which are mapped to circles by the boundary map, then uh, we can show that boundary map, in fact, has to extend the Magus transformation. Or it was a restriction of the Magus transformation, and then the representation is trivial. So uh, this is a stronger theorem uh, than what I stated before. <coughs> so in fact, this theorem actually answers some question asked by Kurt McMullen. So to explain his question, so uh, I want you to actually so see this picture. So whenever I have a four points on S2, so now I am drawing the uh, hyperbolic four model, so my boundary is this sphere. So whenever I have a four points, so this four points determines a unique ideal tetrahedron in H3. So this is the one picture, I have tetrahedron. And in this second picture, my four points lies on uh, this gray circle, and then I still get an ideal tetrahedron, but this time the volume is equal to zero. Okay. So now, uh, by now actually now, there are several actually different proofs of most of the theorem, but uh, one proof given by Gromov and Thurston uh, is based on this following fact. So they use this fact that if you have a homeomorphism of a sphere, and if this homeomorphism maps vertices of every maximum volume tetrahedron to vertices of maximum volume tetrahedron, then it passes to the Magus transformation. So the maximum volume tetrahedron, this is unique of isometry, and then if that maps actually all the maximum volume tetrahedron to maximum volume tetrahedron, then it passes to be a Magus transformation. So again, this is used in Grom of Thurston's proof of most of the theorem. And Kurt Manuela's question was about uh, the other extreme case. So instead of asking maximum volume tetrahedron, so what is the extreme, the other extreme of maximum volume tetrahedron? Zero. Zero volume tetrahedron. So what if we ask the vertices of zero volume tetrahedron to be back to vertices of zero volume tetrahedron, is the still uh, same conclusion true? Okay. Uh, so what if F maps the vertices of zero volume tetrahedron to vertices of zero volume tetrahedron? Does that mean uh, F extends to Davis transformation? And so it's a an easy consequence of our theorem. Yes, that is the case. So in the uh, same hypothesis as before, so omega is, has at least two components. And if our boundary map satisfies, it maps all vertices of zero volume tetrahedron to vertices of zero volume tetrahedron, then F extends to Davis transformation. <coughs> So the relation is simple because, as you saw, the zero volume tetrahedron precisely means that these four points must lie in a circle. And then we are asking four points lying in a circle must be mapped to four points lying in a circle. So that actually, this is an easy consequence of that theorem. Isn't that the same as preserving real cross ratios? Wonderful question. Look at your next slide. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. For, yeah, so for any distinct four points, right, the, the cross ratio, you have this formula for the cross ratio, and the cross ratio of four points uh, is a real, is exactly the same to say that these four points lies in a circle. So as we asked, the, the, another way of formulating this theorem is that if boundary map preserves the realness of cross ratios, meaning that four points with a real cross ratio must be mapped to four points of real cross ratio, then it has to be a Magnus transformation. And I like to emphasize that, of course, the map is defined only on the limit set. So when you talk about these theorems, we are only talking about the points lying on the limit set. Okay, this is the strength of the, uh, the theorem. If you are asking this for all the points, it's not a difficult theorem. The point is that we are only asking what's happening for the points on the limit set. Okay, so now I'll say a few words about uh, the proof. Uh, Somehow, so our proof is actually very different from all other previous proofs, and uh, somehow the novelty is the introdu introducing uh, this point of view of self-joining group, which is the discrete subgroup of the higher rank uh, semi-simple group. Okay? So what is the self-joining group? 
So, okay, I start with some discrete uh, faithful representation of gamma. And self-joining of gamma by rho will be a embedding of gamma into the product of two PSL2 cis using representation rho. Okay? So this is the plain definition. So gamma sub rho, this is my notation for self-joining. It consists of pairs, gamma, comma, this image, rho gamma. Okay? So I started with gamma discrete. Even without asking rho to be discrete, this is already discrete sub rho PSL2c times PSL2c. Okay? So I am diagonally embedding uh, this crystal group into the PSL2 C to C. But this is of course a representation because my second coordinate is determined by the representation. Okay. And the product of two PSL2 C, this is the isometry group of the Riemannian product of hyperbolic three space. Okay. So which means that I can form the quotient of this now rank two Riemannian symmetric space and then to get this locally uh, symmetric manifold. And then uh, this is the infinite volume manifold, no matter what gamma is, and then you project to two hyperbolic three manifolds. This is the picture I have. <coughs> so, so we think of I think of PSL two C times PSL two C as a real algebraic group. So PSL two C, if you just think of it uh, using matrices with a complex coordinate, you can also think of it as a complex group. I want to think of it as a real algebraic group, meaning that PSL two C. Uh, is as a real algebraic group, it can be thought as the orthogonal group uh, of a quadratic form of signature 3, 1. Okay? So I mentioned this because I want to talk about the Zariski density, then I need to talk about what is the Zariski topology I'm, I'm looking at. So it is very simple but very crucial observation for our approach. The representation is trivial. This can be read in terms of the, how, the size of the, the self joining group in the product. So meaning that the self joining gamma rho. It's not Zariski dense if and only if it's trivial. Okay? So if rho is trivial, what does it mean? Rho is a conjugation by some Navier's transformation, right? So then my element would look like a gamma, comma, g, gamma, g inverse for some fixed g. Then what is a Zariski closure? Zariski closure will be simply diagonal embedding of a PSL2C, where the second factor is uh, done by the conjugation. So it is clearly not Zariski dense in the product of two PSL2C. But the converse is also true. If this not Zariski dense, uh, it, it, it means that in fact it has to be trivial. Okay? So to prove my representation is trivial, I want to prove this uh, self-joining is not Zariski dense. Or I want to use uh, some property of self-joining group that I would get if this were Zariski dense. So the goal of, uh, the, goal of the proof of this uh, residency theorem is that we want to show if f maps too many circular slices of lambda into circles, then we want to show that the corresponding self-joining cannot be Zariski dense. Then this would imply rho has to be trivial. So for that, actually, uh, again, the important notion is, the, again, the limit set. But this time, my, my limit set uh, lives in something called the first number boundary. So I'm looking at now S2 times S2. So note that this is not the same as the geometry boundary of H3 times H3, because the geometry boundary of H3 will have S2 times S H3, right? But this is actually kind of the minimal component of the boundary of H3 times H3. It's called the first number boundary. And then by, I'm going to consider by limit set in this first number boundary, but you can define it in the same way. So now I have H3 times H3. I fix some point. I'm, I'm going to look at the orbit, and then I will see where it accumulates on my S2 times S2. Whenever the accumulation does not happen as 2 times S2, I discard, but I'm only collecting things which accumulate on S2 times S2. This is the definition of the limit set. But in our case, because we are assuming the boundary map exists, the limit set has a very simple description. It is simply the graph of my boundary map. Okay? So it is actually just embedding of, well, first of all, actually note that this limit set, whatever it is, it lives inside the product of two limit sets, of gamma times the limit set of rho gamma, and then because of this graph structure of my self-joining group, and then because of the existence of boundary map, the limit set of my self-joining is the graph of F. Okay? So it is uh, simply Cushy combined to Cushy. Remember, it's not the product. It is the diagonal. Okay? So now uh, we will be considering, so, so we are interested in how my boundary map moves circle to circle. But instead of uh, that, actually, I am looking at the space of Torah. The space, by torus I mean the pair of circles. Okay? So pair of circles, so I, have a, so I have a complex plane times complex plane, and then I, I take the two circles, and then uh, I call 
uh, it to be a torus, so for the ordered pair of uh, circuits, okay? So consider the space of all tori which intersect my limit set of the plan, limit set of self-joining group. And then because my limit set is an invariant set for self-joining, so my self-joining and my row will act on the space of all tori intersecting the limit set. And uh, under the condition, gamma is finitely generated and omega disconnected, what we prove is that if f maps the circular slice, C1 intersection lambda to some circle C2, then this circle C1, C2, this torus corresponding to C1, C2, this cannot be dense. This gamma rho will be cannot be dense in the space of all tori intersecting the limit set. And then on the other hand, what we show is that, however, suppose gamma rho was ice dense. We want to get a contradiction, right? But suppose gamma rho was ice dense, then we prove that, in fact, most tori must have dense orbit. Okay? Dense gamma rho orbit. And then uh, it is the incompatibility of these two statements that we prove gamma rho cannot be ice dense. Okay? Of course, actually, uh, the hard part actually goes into the step two, but I only mentioned that. Step two uses dynamics of one parameter diagonal subgroups of this uh, uh, higher rank homogeneous space, the product of PSL2 cis and then divided by gamma rho. Uh, so, actually, so I've noticed that actually the tradition of uh, uh, the lectures, uh, it has to go over time because the, the first two <laughs> lectures were over time. So I didn't have the next three slides originally, but then I had it actually after lunch because I thought like, <laughs> if I don't go over time, then it's an insert to, to the tradition of this seminar. Okay? But, uh, but maybe let me skip the next three slides, but this, I, you know, there was option of explaining more details of the proof, but I uh, skip, but I want to talk about something new. Okay, so I want to revisit. Uh, so sorry, sorry about the crazy conformal study. So after we proved actually this rigidity with the self joinings, I was very excited about the self joinings. Okay, this seems like some miracle. Okay, I'm going to prove something about PSL 2C. I am going to the product of two PSL 2C, and then somehow this relation that row triviality with the non zariski density, this kind of this was very intriguing but very attractive to me. And then uh, towards or to my poster, don't you? So then here is another way of uh, formulating the relevant speed rigidity. So suppose I have a finite generic Kleinian group with a limit set everything, then his uh, quasi conformal rigidity theorem can be formulated in this way. For every quasi conformal deformation, you form a self joining, and it's not a risk dense in the product of PSL2C times PSL2C. I was very intrigued by statement. Okay, it's also true for lattice, right? If you want. Okay, so I have some representation, and then I write down some discrete subgroup in the product of PSL2, CPSL2. What on earth actually somehow forces this group to be Zariski dense or non Zariski dense? So I was very intrigued about this, so we asked uh, is there an alternative, uh, alternate proof of Sullivan's PSL2 conformal study using properties of self joining? Okay, and uh, yes, actually, so we realized. Uh, uh, in 2023, which is this year, which is this month. <laughs> Actually, we realized uh, November of last year, but the preprint is now available in my web page, so we in 2023. So we noticed actually, so these above conditions, which means the finite general Kleinian group and will limit everything. This forces some identity in conformal measure classes of self joining in this first number boundary, which is not possible if gamma rho was ice dense. So I'm not going to actually define uh, what is conformal measure here, but uh, as uh, as many of you know, actually, so this conformal measure uh, for Kleinian group, uh, something called the Patterson Sullivan measure, this is hugely, hugely important uh, in rigidity and dynamics and everything. So for the last 15 years, I think almost all of my papers are besides the Dennis paper uh, on this Patterson Sullivan measures. But then actually there is a actually higher rank version of this theory. So you, you, you can in fact actually talk about any discrete group, not only Kleinian group or any rank one group, but for any semi-simple real algebra group, any rank, there is a notion of a conformal measure and then there is a notion of a higher rank version of a Sullivan measure. So here I can also, we can also talk about uh, the higher rank conformal measure class for self joinings in the, in the in the, the first number boundary, and then we notice that if gamma rho was Zariski dense, then these conformal measures has to be more or less somehow. There has to be a lot of conformal measures, and then they have to be 
mutually singular in some cases. But however, these conditions actually, or both forces actually, some identity in these conformal measure classes, and I can be a little bit more precise. So this is a rough idea. So suppose I have this uh, uh, quasi conformal homeomorphism associated to my quasi conformal deformation. Then uh, this is exactly where the dimension at least two is used. This map is actually almost everywhere differentiable and it's Jacobian, it's not trivial, which means that if I push the Lebesgue measure by this boundary map or by this quasi conformal homeomorphism, then it is equivalent to the Lebesgue measure. So the Lebesgue measure class does not change. Okay? And this means that, uh, this is equivalent to say that actually, now I'm going to look at a measure on the product of uh, S2 times S2, this first number boundary, by just uh, considering the push forward by the diagonal map. So the first component, so identity times F2 means that X goes to X comma FX, okay? So I can push forward my measure on S2 to uh, measure to S2 times S2 using uh, identity times F2 and on the other hand, F inverse times identity. So the, this condition uh, is equivalent to say that actually these two measure classes as a measure on the product, they have to be absolutely continuous to each other. They have to be the same measure class. On the other hand, we can show that if gamma rho was Zariski dense, in fact, to do these two measures cannot be in the same measure class. They have to be, in this case, actually mutually singular to each other. Okay? And of course, the, there are many things which go into this part, but I just wanted the uh, tell you actually this somehow now the conformal higher the conformal measures of these self joinings actually this uh, this can be used actually to give another proof of this most of the one quasi conformal residual this theorem so this proof this uh, this is another argument and then in fact actually using actually the observations we learned actually or uh, discovering this argument uh, we have now the measure theoretic version of my original theorem so our original theorem so, but in this case, we are assuming gamma and rho gamma are now convex for compact. Okay? So, I didn't define what convex for compact groups are, but I defined the geometrically finite groups. So, geometrically finite groups without parabolic elements, these are convex for compact groups. Okay? Suppose uh, I have a convex for compact group, and then suppose my representation is again discrete phase for, but the image is supposed it is again convex for compact. And then again, I have the same hypothesis. Uh, now, this time I'm just saying, okay, the domain of this continuity of gamma, the limit set of gamma is not connected. Then suppose uh, delta to denote, let delta denote the Hausdorff dimension of the limit set. Okay? So remember I have this limit set, which is like a fractal set, so I uh, can consider the Hausdorff dimension of the limit set. So it is somewhere between zero and two. Okay? And then uh, this is also the theorem. Because of my convex for compact assumption, if I look at the house delta dimension house sort of measure on my limit set, this is non-trivial measure. It's a finite measure and it's all non-trivial. It's non-zero and then uh, finite measure. Okay? So I can talk about uh, the house sort of measure on my limit set and then the statement that instead of looking at open collection of circles, but as long as I know that the circular slices which are mapped to circles by F that has positive dimensional, I mean the positive house sort of measure then this is already enough to conclude uh, the representation is trivial. Okay? So uh, in here, actually, roughly, I can say that, so using this house of measure, we can actually create a conformal measure for my self-joining uh, in, in this higher and homogeneous space, and then uh, we use some result proved ergodistic for the directional flow, uh, proved by Berger, Landersberg, uh, Mizu, Lee, and myself, and then using the ergodicity, actually, we can upgrade our previous theorem in this uh, measure sense. I don't think I'm over time. Sorry.
then that means the hypothesis is false. I'm not sure if it's false or we just don't prove, right? I don't say it's the false. We just I, we don't make no, any statement. A implies B, not B implies not A. I, I had to memorize that because I find it very hard to understand that. Yeah. If, if rho is not true, yes. know, then your hypothesis is not true. Right, but then when no, omega, no, 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 is, but, uh, I mean, omega is disconnected, uh, okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and disconnected. Yeah. Well, oh, I see, Shakti is not disconnected. Yeah. Right, right, yes. Mm -hmm. Open right. But anyway, take a deformation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, take a quasi stufuxian group, quasi yes. deformation. That's disconnected. Then that says your circle property is thin. It doesn't have positive health. Rate. Exactly right. So what I agree. Can you yes. say what? So can you say what that means? So it means. Oh, what's f? F was this uh, crazy conformer homeomorphism or oh, the, the boundary map. Yeah, or the boundary map. Oh, I see. So. Yeah. Oh, this homeomorphism has to take four points and. Right. Screw Do them very up. right. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. But, but your question about the Shakti group is interesting because uh, so for in, the, in Shakti group actually this theorem does not imply so it could be that so I don't know this example is there actually Shakti group that where every uh, circular slice of the limit set has only three points and most three points in that case uh, it will prove that the theorem is not true for Shakti group because uh, the condition is empty and then of course there are deformations of Shakti groups but so. Do you know, like, is there an example of a Shaki group that every circular slice contains at most the three points? Mm -hmm. Okay, so don't know. Yeah. So this conjecture, of, I mean, this theorem, or this theorem says, of course, that there are many, many circular slices which contains more than four points, right? Yeah. yeah. But four. yeah, and this four, right? Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? So no. is nobody asking about the higher dimensional generalization? <laughs> <laughs> you, okay. you said like it was very essential that like you were thinking about like the real algebraic group for like SO three one. Yeah. Right? Like, are you able to say things about like self joining on like SO n one? Yes, like, exactly. Right. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's a general condition. Why for hyperbolic three manifold? Right. Because most of CRM is only true for all yeah, dimension higher than three. So we can also prove analog of this uh, for higher dimensional hyperbolic manifolds. But the, the one issue is that there are, we don't know actually too many examples of Kleinian groups where the omega is disconnected. But of course there are examples. You have this all these uh, examples where the limit set uh, is, uh, I mean, the complement of limit set is infinitely many different spheres and so on and so on. But then uh, analog theorem is also true for higher dimensional hyperbolic manifolds as well. Oh. Yeah. I have another question. Can you hope to prove some of this for uh, higher dimensions? I just said that we can do it for higher dimension, right? Oh, I didn't hear. Yeah, we can do it also for higher dimension, but uh, I can also say that uh, this uh, somehow the different approach to Zeriman's quasi conformal rigidity actually, this we can do it for any general rank one, and then we can also do it even <coughs> when actually the target goes into higher rank uh, algebraic group. So there's some kind of uh, measure rigidity statement uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, in the back. Is there an analog of this result for a Martin set, or say Julius set, or something like that? Oh, very good question. Yeah, that will be very interesting. Right, like, of course, uh, we should ask that question, uh, yeah, by Sariba Dictionary. Can I hear the question again? So, yeah, I mean, if there is actually this story, you know, on the other side of the Sullivan's dictionary, if there's an analog of this for rational maps, that was the question. Well, uh, I mean, for rational maps, you can have, uh, it offers uh, conjecture for one thing, it's not true, right? You right. can have uh, even a degree two polynomial that uh, has uh, a Julia set in this positive measure. This is being constructed. <laughs> So it's already No, but then it's so. not like I am using Arthur's measure conjecture. I just mentioned that as a motivation, like, okay, oh. we know everything oh, about when lambda is everything. So now lambda is very, very small. What can you say? So this was like only motivational remark. We don't use anything about uh, Arthur's okay. measure conjecture. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I think the question makes sense, but I'm not sure. 
here because we are kind of looking at this homogeneous dynamics, okay, you have this gym of gamma and then we are taking advantage of all this. Uh, Any other questions? If not, let's thank our speaker.